now, sweetheart. I am here to tell you that you all should be going to church. No, seriously. We should encourage as many to attend church on a regular basis as possible. Now, before you call the ACLU, who will be absolutely salivating to sue me, first let me clarify, or at least use my freedom of speech and religion one more time before you haul me off. I know this is the land of the free, and no one person should be telling another what to do or believe. But before you write me off as a right-wing religious wacko, clinging to my gun and Bible, um, let's take a moment and think about what religious communities offer to the well-being of individuals, communities, and our country. In a world filled with intolerance, we Americans live in a unique society, one that both values freedom of conscience and has a strong religious tradition. On any given day of worship, 40% of Americans attend some sort of religious service. That figure rises in times of stress. Post 9-11 saw a 65% church attendance for us. On the other hand, in Europe, this is closer to 5%. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there are other cultures that demand religious conformity to the point of using violence against their own people. Look at the growing violence against Coptic Christians of Egypt or the anti-religious campaign the old Soviets used against any of their people who went to church. To understand why church attendance should be the subject of a genuine social dialogue, let's look at the origins of our unique traditions of religious freedom balanced with a cultural importance on church, then open our eyes to where this uneasy dynamic has taken us today, and close with some evidence to show that church attendance, any church, benefits our society. When we look back colonial times, we forget how what we call freedom today looks nothing like the colonial freedoms. The reality of colonial religious freedom and liberty is much more complex than the Pilgrim story. Colonial religious freedom was driven by a need to practice my religion freely, but not to let you practice your religion with any freedom at all. Most of the colonies by the time of the revolution had a government supported church. In Virginia and the rest, in Massachusetts, it was the Puritans and their congregational church. In Virginia and the rest of the South, it was the Church of England, or Episcopalian, as we call it in America today. Everybody took turns beating up and imprisoning the Radical Society of Friends, or Quakers, of Delaware and Pennsylvania. The Protestants tried to kill all the Catholics in their home colony of Maryland, and Dutch New York was the only colony that accepted Jewish people on anywhere near equal footing. In the majority of the colonies, every citizen had to tie to official colonial church, and public office holders had to be a member of that state church. The idea that we were one happy faith family was a warm, fuzzy myth. At the Constitutional Convention, a couple of things became clear. If all of these groups were working together, you had to take one of two approaches. Either make everyone the same religion, a state church, or make it illegal to have religious requirements on public office holding. With such an intense diversity and a growing agnostic community, the only solution was one of legal tolerance, so the religious freedom that the First Amendment was born. The First Amendment resulted from a need to accommodate religious diversity, not a fear that everyone would be forced to join a particular denomination. In other words, freedom of religion, instead of the modern interpretation of freedom from religion. The value of individual religious faith was never meant to be devalued, rather strengthened by the constitutional protection. In the following century, America gave birth to new faith communities like Jehovah's Witnesses, Latter-day Saints, and the bedrock of American faith communities, the Evangelical Movement. We have been joined in this mix by people of many faiths that were not present in colonial days. Our neighbors now include Hindus, Muslims, and countless other faith traditions, and our country is being further enriched by the values that these faith communities instill. However, since the turn of the last century, we have witnessed one of the most dramatic social shifts in history. Religion's respected historical role as a reservoir for ethics, service, and duty has gone from dominating our lives to becoming something that is becoming openly resented and ridiculed in modern Western culture. This new view places churches in a spectrum from inconvenient anachronisms to strongholds of bigotry, sexism, and moral absolutism. I'm going to suggest to you that we may be throwing something of great societal value out a sense of community service and personal stability that no government or philosophy has successfully replaced. Without looking at various religious doctrines or beliefs, and without putting forward a necessary belief in a divinity, is there any value to going to church on a regular basis? Is our society enriched, united, and stabilized by what people learn in church and do every other day of the week? A 
qualifier. All studies show that functioning, stable family has the greatest effect on the health of children and our communities. As we look at the overall effect of church, we must recognize that churches, no matter the size of denomination, extend that family effectiveness, supporting moral values that lead to productive behaviors as a government or school institutions demonstrably cannot. Secondly, I fully recognize that individuals can live to high moral and service standards without having any religious values attached to that ethical behavior. Well, Admiral, today I am looking at the overall impact of church on attendance on society as a whole. Bear with me in this next section. There are going to be a lot of quotes here. I cannot get you to rethink your stand based on my opinions. My point is not to convince you someone to believe in church because they believe in some deity or miracles. Rather, to show that there is something in a church life. Something that seems to work no matter what we say about it. Something that leads to measurable and practical behaviors that create healthy and happy individuals and communities. Let's look at how church tents can shape individual behavior and influence our society. Thomas J. Hayes, PhD, states, On the subject of role models, one fact cannot be ignored. Exposure to church, religion, and the values they teach leads to healthy personal development, minimization of antisocial behavior, and abstinence or responsible use of substances. Studies confirm that children who grow up with regular church contact and participation lead psychologically healthier lives. They are much less li likely to use alcohol and drugs, much less likely to divorce, and much less likely to break the law. They have a better sense of the impact of their behaviors on others and are less likely to think and behave selfishly. With such astounding statistics, it's a wonder why our churches are not packed week after week with parents trying to instill a greater sense of value in their children. Olivia Williams, a professional counselor, observed, The church can act as a stage on which to practice moral behavior through customs unmatched by other social institutions. Next, there seems to be a strong correlative effect between uh, regular church attendance and mental and physical health. Psychiatrist H.G. Cohen found, the relationships between religious activities and blood pressure was examined in a six-year perspective study of 4,000 older adults. Among subjects who attended religious services once a week or more and prayed or studied the Bible once a day or more, the likelihood of diastolic hypertension was 40% lower than among those who attended services and prayed less often. <laughs> wow, a preventive health care that doesn't require an insurance policy or a government program. Yet another study done by a team of psychiatrists looked at the effects of intercessory prayer, prayer for others who were sick. The finding, major adverse cardiac events were reduced in individuals in the prayer group, as were death and readmission rates, 33% to 35%. Next, studies have found that school and government programs aimed at reducing drug use among the young people have no measurable effect. However, many studies have validated the fact that the most effective drug programs out there are regular church attendance. Here is just one of those many studies, this time from Great Britain, where researchers found a much higher proportion of both non-religious males and females consumed over the maximum safe limit of alcohol for their gender and used tobacco, marijuana, marijuana, amphetamines, LSD, and ecstasy compared to the very religious students. Let's look at the positive effect of churches on our communities. A detailed study of churches in Philadelphia found that churches do much more community aiding work, including helping the poor, than previously realized by scholars. The authors declare, if it were not for the impressive collective effort of some 2,000 local religious congregations, life in Philadelphia would become extremely harsh. Can add. Also, in Philadelphia, congregations on average provided 2.33 different social programs, body. Another study shows that a typical church provides financial support, volunteers, space, and in-kind donations to six community programs a year. Ammerman. Time keeps me from, from presenting them dozens of studies that indicate going to church makes us healthy, happy, less prone to damage ourselves by indulging what the old Catholic Church referred to as our appetites, and makes our community safer and more caring. So, before we let our churches die from either apathy or a direct attack, we should look at their impacts. Maybe we, as a society, should revisit the importance of an active church life to the health of our society. While government agencies and school districts spend vast amount of money on programs that have mixed results, maybe we should be encouraging something we do know works. Church. Any church. Here's a conclusion that is very politically incorrect. The evidence indicates that a government that encourages an active church life 
would be much more effective at delivering social services and spend considerably less money on bur burgeoning welfare programs. Government programs could then target the remaining money much more effectively to those who have no support systems. But please, don't let that comment leave this room. If today's speech led you to just think about it, either rejecting or getting consider consideration, I have succeeded. As I started, so I end. I'm here to tell you to go to church. For your health, your happiness, and the health and happiness of your community. Thank you. All right.